All right, now I want to welcome Matt Rollins, our special guest on the YWAM Converge radio podcast. Um, Matt is a YWAMer, and he's an author of several books and a consultant in the business sphere. Um, among others, his books include The Green Bench, A Dialogue About Leadership and Change, and a sequel, apparently, Humility, uh, the Race, How Do You Prepare Yourself for the Unknown? A lot of books about uncertain times. I hope that <laughs> Matt will share us a little, a little bit about that. So I've really been looking forward to this conversation, Matt. Um, welcome. Uh, okay. Would you give us a little, you know, uh, just to our little listening audience, a little more information about yourself and tell us yeah. about um, the consulting agency or what it is that you do? Yeah. Well, thanks, John. It's a privilege to... Uh, join you and uh, yeah, see, hopefully God shows up and we have a conversation that touches his heart a bit. Um, maybe a little background. I started, I did a discipleship training school in YWAM in 1978. I went on, I, to be honest, I never really, I didn't get a great call to missions. I just fell in love with Jesus. And uh, um, I, in very practical terms, when I fell in love with Jesus, I knew I couldn't go home. Um, because I wasn't strong enough. So I, I kind of yeah, asked the Lord, yeah. can I continue in this process? And so one, uh, one of the staff of my DTS um, asked me to join him on an outreach. So I ended up spending three, an eight month outreach, which turns into three years in Saipan. And then I was a year in Hong Kong and where I met my wife. And then we took over the work in Singapore for five years. So that was all kind of the that was really a good foundation for me because it allowed me to kind of think through who do I love and why do I love him. Uh, left YWAM Singapore in 88, went back, went back to school, got, uh, did more schooling than I probably should have, but it was good and bad in, in just a variety of different ways. Got mm -hmm. a PhD in leadership and communication, organizational development, actually studied YWAM. And um, then in 2005, moved back to Singapore and uh, started a consulting company. So I have been working there for the last uh, 13 years. Now, Matt, you initially called it the Green Bench, but now it's something else, isn't that right? Well, my company is called Green Bench Consulting. Okay. And uh, not real creative, but nonetheless, it was because the first book I wrote was called The Green Bench. So I just, you know, metaphorically, a green bench is a place oftentimes in a natural setting where you can sit and talk at kind of a heart level. So I kind of carried that metaphor into my company. The company, my tagline on my company is, if you can talk about it, you can change it. Mm. And uh, so that's the kind of the reference point where I land when I'm working with people. Oh, wow, that's good. That's real good. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of I mean, I studied uh, leadership also at Fuller Seminary. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, Bobby Clinton. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then we did some of uh, Adiz's. We looked at, uh, you know, familiar with that, the cycles of, of a growth of a company or the, yeah, the, yeah. and uh, if you come to that point where you've passed the go go and you've begun to mature well, you better reevaluate everything because the only, yeah. only only step next is down yeah you, you yeah. have to look for what's the next growth growth yeah. turn isn't that right yeah the the word kind of where i've kind of landed in regards to a lot of my work is how do we deal with tension um, I, I find that more and more that's kind of a bigger um, an emotional tagline, and uh, and oftentimes it's those tension points and transitions that either allows us to be able to move forward or gets us into trouble. So, yeah, I'll, I reference it not around growth cycles directly, although those are very valid and real. I, I I'll reference it around tension points. When we hit a tension point, we know that we're in either a, an opportunity or if we don't pass it we'll go around and come back to it again so uh -huh. yeah those are common things All right yeah well we met i think the first time perhaps kona briefly and then bertany a little bit more yeah. i believe at one of those uh either yeah. a wet paint event or yeah a, something like that something like that yeah <clears throat> so but you were, you were involved with YWAM's University of the Nations and yeah. the College of Communications primarily. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, I would do a lot of stuff with Landa and uh, we did some workshops together and that's kind of been the place where I fit in after I kind of left full time. 
Yeah. Uh, I still spend two or three months a year doing some training and teaching, but yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my question is this, it's really twofold. It's um, how did the experience working with the university of the nations and in your experience with youth with a mission benefit you where you are now and yeah. how might those who are in that place at youth with a mission or in that kind of that, that valley of decision, do I go into ministry or do I go into business? Yeah. And where is it most appropriate for me? And should ministries be talking about changing nations through business or should they just release their people to go do it? Oh, multiple questions. Let's go back to the first one. I'm, I can't hold, I'm still on a bit of jet lag. So what, what, what's the first question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. So how did that experience benefit you? Yeah. Well, when I, when I fell in love with God, I think the thing that really, really helped me was I did a, a particularly in sight pen, I would wake up early every morning and I'd get out of Strong's Concordance and a notebook and my Bible. And I began to study the character of God. So every place where the word righteousness is mentioned, I would in Strong's, I would then look it up and begin to meditate on the attributes of God. And so um, you know, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So you get the, the idea that justice is a governmental position that God wants to take. And so I, I just began to go through all the attributes of God over those years and began to study him. And I, I think that that was absolutely core for me, that I needed, I needed a foundation that was strong enough to be able to handle who I was and who God was and how was I supposed to live. So that was that. I, I will be forever thankful for that time and space to kind of build in. You know, love, is, love is rooted in knowledge, and knowledge is not abstract. Knowledge is personal. So I had to get to know personally who this God was and what yeah. he thought, and what he loved and didn't love and some of those attributes. So that was really, really foundational for me. I, I, I look back often on those times and think I don't know how I would have survived some of the other challenges that I was confronted with if I hadn't had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those that are in that place where they're in the mission or in ministry and they're sensing that maybe God wants them involved in business, what's your, yeah. what's your word for them? Yeah. Well, you know, it's been kind of an interesting journey because I, as much as we talk about it, you know, after my, well, with the 10 years, then I was with YWAM later after that. So probably 15 to 20 years of actual time with them, you, you develop kind of an emotional arrogance. I, I, I don't know how else to say it because you haven't, as you're involved in ministry, you, you feel superior. And I, I don't really like to say that, but I, I think that's part of what unconsciously um, you, you get a sense of that while I'm doing ministry, that must make me more lovable or more valuable. And it's, such a subtle thing that I don't think we ever really recognize it until we leave it or we, we step outside of it. So I, I recognize that for many of those years, I, I felt a bit um, superior because I, I was doing spiritual work and because I was involved in missions or in this ministry. And, and that's not about YWAM. That's really just about me. That was just me growing through that. So so when I, when I started to think that maybe there was a different opportunity and maybe, you know, there were other expressions of faith that, that God was laying before me, I began to kind of, I had to kind of do a little heart surgery, to be honest, to kind of get really root out this whole idea of the secular and the sacred, that really root out this idea that um, one aspect or expression of, you know, as soon as we use the word ministry, you automatically think spiritual work. And as soon as you use the word business, you think of, oh, just physical labor as, um, you know, only valid if it's supporting ministry. So all of these kind of subtleties had kind of taken root in my heart. And, and I realized I needed to kind of, part of the process for me was to go back and go, no, this is not true. This is, I, I don't see this in the word. And I had to kind of take a hold of my own heart and bring it before God and say, okay, God, how do I, how do I start to work through this process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the young person, let's say they, maybe they're not all that young. Maybe they've been in ministry for a, 
you know, a half dozen or a dozen years. And they're yeah. saying, there's a shift happening in my heart. I'm thinking maybe business. What's your initial yeah. like first couple words for them, you think? Well, I think go for it. I, I, I think the, um, I, I think honestly, one of the strengths of YOM is we're a movement, but I think one of the challenges when leaving YOM, and I often find that people say, well, it was living in a bubble when I was in YWAM. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that we really have to kind of work through, even as we define what is reality. And I, I mean, I have to say over these last 13 years, well, even over this last year, if I just take this last year, I've had more heart to heart conversations with people who are not necessarily believers, um, but can connect at a heart level than I did at after five years of ministry in YWAM. So mm -hmm. The, the chance to engage people, the chance to have really good heart-to-heart -heart conversations, because I do executive coaching and a variety of different things along those lines. So it, it really has given me, I, I find myself more radically in love with God and um, engaging people far more than um, many of my years, um, you know, either as a base director or a variety of different things. So the, I think the, the thing to really own, <clears throat> the first thing you always have to own when you're, when you're looking at a new direction, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're looking at a new direction is, okay, God, do I have the faith to do this? Because the Bible is pretty clear. There's that which is not a faith, a sin. And this is a victory mm -hmm. that overcomes the world is our faith. So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a faith piece in this that says, I have the faith to believe that God is in this. And as long as we have that, and I think for me, that's the reference point that says, okay, this is, this is going to be how God wants to reveal him to me, to me um, through this, a sphere or this aspect that I want to be able to walk into. So that's the, for me, that's kind of a core piece. I, I found myself rising up in faith thinking, you know, where we're really hurting at a national level in many of the nations is businesses are, are um, not being run as, as, you know, you can't really trust business in, in some of the situations that we're confronted with. So, yeah, I think all the spheres need salt and light in them. Right. And there's no way to do that unless people are sent into those spheres That's right. from the position of faith. They don't, I mean, there are certainly those that come to faith in the sphere of business, yeah. but for them to be able to step back from it and see the sphere of business as a mission field, yeah. that's, yeah, yeah. that's a, that, that takes a little bit of a reorientation. So, yeah. And I don't, I, I would even go as far as to say, I don't even need to see it as a mission field. Um, I just see it as a, as a harvest field. You know, um, I think you mentioned Tom Bloomer, the garden. It, it's all the garden. God, God's interested in all the garden. We don't need to label something as a mission in order to validate it. It, it has validation because God is in all spheres. You don't right. need to, you know, put any of these uh, arts. You don't need to use religious art or whatever. Beauty is God. So, yeah, those are the things that have really kind of come alive to me in a new way over these last years as I look at and invest in building um, a business that um, blesses people, it honors God, and doesn't, isn't necessarily religious in nature. Yeah, that's so, – so what if, – if I can use some language um, along yeah, the line yeah. of what Tom, Tom Marshall used to Good. talk on this, yeah. right? You're familiar yeah. with it. Yeah, yeah. He would talk about reconciliation of all things. And yeah. some people would go off on a tangent like, well, is he talking that we're supposed to bring total redemption before Jesus comes? <laughs> no, whatever. But no, we are sent as ambassadors of reconciliation, reconciling, re reconciling all things. Yes, all people, yeah. um, all nations, right? All yeah. communities, yeah, yeah. Yeah. families, but yeah. also every... Um, Every sphere of human association, like yeah. the sphere of business, needs to yeah. be reconciled back to him to reflect his character. Yeah, Isn't yeah. that right? So yeah, yeah, we're yeah. sent as ambassadors That's right. to reconcile that sphere back to being a representation of his righteousness. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I, you know, I, the reason I use the word non-religious, because I, I think even times, sometimes my frustration, to be honest, with Christians is we don't know how to live and express truth unless we quote scriptures and the, of course when you're working in those domains where people are not familiar with scriptures um, 
they, they have no idea what you're talking about when you use that language. And when you look at the life of Jesus, unless he, you know, he was, when he was speaking with the Pharisees or the religious community, he would use scripture. But when he was dealing with the rest of, of life, he would use language like, you know, we're, we talk about this in regards to a farmer or, you know, this story or this story and, and create a language that was very engaging for the people. So, yeah, I think, I think that it's a really important part that we've got to remember who God is and how he wants to meet with us wherever we are. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he wants to meet with us in our business. That's right. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, we've been talking about abiding, abiding yeah. in Christ. Um, you know, he said, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. And yeah. we think of abiding oftentimes in a little bit of a religious uh, overlay. We say yeah. we're abiding in the God of peace. And yeah. the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. goodness, kindness, yeah. you know, gentleness, yeah. self-control. We, we're yeah. abiding in the character of God. And those are all true and right. But what about abiding in the gardener or in the teacher or in the counselor? Yeah. And that bearing fruit as a lawgiver and a just judge, isn't that yeah. also abiding in him? And can yeah. you unpack what that looks like in the sphere business? Yeah. The, uh, well, I, I think the, the thing we've got to go back to is, is abiding is a relational word. And and when you love someone and when you know they love you, you establish a presence. The, we could call it an abiding presence. And that, that's, we take that with us wherever we go. And so in business, I think that, you know, when I go in and work with people, um, it's, it's bringing um, the presence of God, but in a very non-religious way. And, I, you know, you say that and people will have a variety of different reactions to it because it, it, unfortunately, even today in many situations, and I hate to say this, but when we use the word Christian, we have these ideas that are not relu related to Christ-like that are more religious in nature that, oh, they're against this or, or they don't like that or they're, you know, and I, and I think that's what we've got to kind of grow roots to go deep enough that our presence with God's presence in us is the transformation point where we meet and intersect with um, life. Mm, yeah. 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 He, this is the worldview thing. When you talk about sacred and secular, you know, yeah. um, there are the, I mean, what, Paul is constantly uh, writing of this in the letters. He, he says, you know, it's foolishness to the Greeks yeah. and it's a rock of offense to the Jews, he himself, yeah. the cross, his embodiment is yeah. an offense to the Jew and, a, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and it's foolishness to the Greeks. And yeah. so we don't recognize just how much we are Greek or Jew today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, it's interesting. I love that scripture because uh, um, a lot of the work that I do when I'm working with businesses and working with uh, in Singapore, um, civil service and opportunities there um part of the work i think in, in in trying to help people is the real question that i like to give to them is how are you present in the midst of tension and because that's really the dividing point in regards to whether you can move ahead um you know people become when there's tension they either become defensive and withdraw or they become aggressive and it's what i love about that is when when god was interacting with humanity he became present with us mm -hmm. in the midst of our tension and that presence was the difference that was the revelation point and i think we're to model his presence by being present in tension by being present in business by being present in these places and by that presence we bring something that is radical in nature. Radical just means to get to the root or the essence of something. So yeah, I think that's, that's a big challenge for us. Wow, yeah. I, you know, on a personal note, um, I, when I face tension, my first, my first thought is retreat. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, <laughs> you know, go away, don't yeah. be there. Now, in some cases, yeah, yeah. you need to learn how to say, I'm not going to be with that particular situation because it, it may be a person or a situation that's yeah. just, it's not healthy. So you, you yeah. know, some removal is healthy. But there's other times yeah. when you, so, you, know, you have to say, no, I actually, I'm called to lead in this situation. So I have to stand up and yeah. be present in the midst yeah. of that tension. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so a lot of work that I do, um, and I, I, I've had to think a lot about this because I'm a little bit like you, John. I, t to be honest, I'm a coward at heart. I, I don't like tension. Uh, my first automated response is I want to hide. I'm a professional hider. I get it. But then I fell in love with God, and that, that forced me to think, you know, because he, where his presence is, that's where I want to go. That where his presence is, that's where I want to be. And I have to show up in that process. And so I, I have to learn not to hide. And so I had to, I had to kind of relanguage the whole idea of tension. So, you know, without going into, into a teaching mode, which I don't want to do, but just to highlight a point, God is not afraid of tension. He creates tension. So he puts a tree in the middle of the garden that creates tension for Adam and Eve. He allows the serpent into the garden that creates tension for Adam and Eve. So, so we have to reevaluate tension that God isn't afraid of tension. There's nothing that causes him to withdraw, that he will walk into all tension situations and be with you in those situations and then invites us into that. So part of this is relanguaging tension to be able to go, okay, there's nothing to fear in tension because God is present in the midst um, of it with us when we walk into it in faith. So that's, I'm, that's my reorientating. And, you know, as I sometimes jokingly say to myself, I got to put my big boy pants on because the little boy in me wants to hide, but I just got to say, no, I've got to figure out how to walk into this in a way that isn't manipulating or controlling or in denial. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, I think that's a big challenge for our leaders in any sphere. So how do we be involved in business without being controlling or hiding or manipulating? How do we be involved as a father without yeah. being controlling or manipulating or hiding? How, you know, I mean, you could pick each of the domains and how do we walk into those um, being present and, and controlling or bringing God, the God of peace into our emotions so that our anxiety level, so we learn to walk into it in a way that is honoring to who he has called us to be. So that's a huge challenge. I mean, it's the lifelong challenge for us. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to carry on this conversation forever. <laughs> um, let, me, let me toss a few softballs at you when okay. people say business and they, um, they say, well, business and mission, well, you're talking about two different things here, aren't you? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I've seen those who do mission as business and yeah. I've often kind of wondered, how can you do that? Aren't yeah. we supposed to love people? Uh, there's some, there's, there's some tension there certainly, yeah. Yeah. but, but, but business is often immediately thought of by the typical Christian with these initial scriptures. I'm going to just lob at you and I'll let you kind of react to them. I'll, okay. I'll give you three to start real quick okay. ones. Um, first All thought right. is that, um, you know, I think it's Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, basically, all this business is meaningless. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's nothing new <laughs> under the sun. And what are we doing this for? Um, that's one. And yeah. Okay. Well, let me, I, I won't remember the other. So let me just, let okay. me pick Solomon. So Solomon starts off meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So he's not picking on a particular domain. He's picking on a life of a man who has 700 concubines and more, you know what I mean, who's gone into futility and, and lost the meaning of life. So he's not picking on any particular domain. He's just picking on a life. And you can, it goes across the border. All life is meaningless um, when you lose the reference point, the plumb line, that, that perspective of God. And, and he's got some great wisdom, but, but he, he, he lost it in those later years um, because he didn't pay... Uh, heed to the counsel of God in regards to self-control. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So he acquired a lot and he lost. Yeah. He lost meaning. Yeah. He, yeah. He, because you, you know, you, you, the, the power is, is a flesh, you know what I mean? What did Billy Graham say? Glory. Um, 
of the three things. Basically, it was power, uh, sex, and money are the things that will get guys in control. And, um, you know, when you start to pursue those, you're moving away from meaning in life. And that's where business is particularly seductive because mm -hmm. um, we, you, you can get your eyes on um, distractions or seduction points. And, and you, if you don't learn the discipline, as in any aspect of life, you can get yourself into trouble. But that doesn't make it an evil thing. It just means it's an opportunity for the grace of God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another scripture here is uh, Exodus 22, where it speaks of uh, charging interest or usury, um, that we're not to do that. Yeah, yeah. So well, I love business is built on the whole notion of, of yeah. wealth through interest. Yeah, well, I, I think, again, I, like, the question isn't, see, I, I, it's, the question is how you do business, not the presupposition is, is business of God? Yes, it's, it's, it's how we uh, gainful employment. It's how Jehovah Jireh supplies uh, the means for us to be able to pay the expressions of bills of life in this process. And what I think God was so wisely trying to he looked at these points and he said, okay, these are going to be the points that will get you into trouble. You're going to want to charge interest. And, you know, when you look at businesses that start to charge interest and the money that is made, um, you know, credit card sometimes is 20, 21% where you're literally enslaved. You mm -hmm. make interest only payments. So I, I think the point that God is saying, uh, trying to be really clear is how you deal with money and, and how you use money is gonna be actually vital to this process. And I wanna give you a heads up that you, you're gonna to wanna to charge interest in how you do business and particularly endorse key relationships. Don't do it because I don't want you to be enslaved to each other. Now, I think he says also that you can charge interest to other people. So it's not, he's not making an absolute out, but he's just trying to protect us from greed where we would enslave um, people in, a, in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So we, over and over again, I'm hearing an undertone that really business is all about relationships. And, yeah. you know, and you're, you're not to do business in a way that is like, I'm taking control, I'm controlling you. Instead, it's yeah. I'm, I'm coming in as a, like you said, the word father a while ago. Um, yeah. I'm going to be a father in this situation. I'm going to be a leader. I am going to yeah. direct or, or steer, but yeah. I'm not controlling you as if you're some kind of an object. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that, that gets back to what we would, you know, a core aspect of what we would just define as leadership. So when Jesus uses the language of, you know, you shall be a servant of all, it's interesting that he uses that when he's talking about leaders and he's, He's defining a person to represent leadership who has no line responsibility, you know, and, 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 and yet we, you know, we translate it into washing someone's feet, which has actually become now a religious exercise. But what he was really saying was, do not use a position of power to dominate others to extend your will. That is destructive. And, and the, across all the spheres, when we, um, when we do that in a church, it becomes destructive. When we do it as a father, it becomes destructive. And, yeah. and I, it scares me, to be honest with you, even some of our Christians today, we want to do it politically uh, in the name of God. We want yeah. this, we seeking out the power and we want them to extend our will um, and really make it God's will. And it, it's, um, yeah, it's, oh. It's yeah, crazy. yeah. I, uh, you know, you know, future podcasts we're going to be talking with somebody with a fellowship of christian uh athletes yeah and um the word coach is now a word that can have negative connotations so <laughs> there's a power there and yeah. you know, there are those that have used their coaching yeah know, yeah it's been destructive yeah and, um yeah so um it's not just the sphere of business this is leadership yeah, yeah, it's it's the basics. It's just it's just people who who won't own their brokenness um, and and bring God into that, and uh, and then they just use it to to just extend their brokenness into other lives. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, 
Ezekiel 27 speaks of a long lament over Tyre and all of her business dealings, you know, yeah. many products and trading human beings. Yeah. And, and what, in the same breath, it says human beings and articles of bronze. Yeah. Everything's been commodified. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh... Well, God uses, God uses anybody and he used, you know, uses nations, he uses donkeys, he uses to, you know, to accomplish, speak or correct or all of these types of things. And I, I think, you know, when he's talking about Tyre, and I think if you, if you're, you have to be really careful to say he's good, he uses, that's a business thing to correct people with in that process. I, he uses the nations to correct the nations at times. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it'd be a hard stretch, um, to be honest, because you, you know, the, one of the most talk, talked about, um, as far as just if you did a verse count, and I hate to say that, but in the sense of what he's talking about, he talks about business probably more than any other sphere. Um, as you start to look at um, his word through the Old Testament and how he was trying to train the Jews in, in regards to the values and what, he, what was important. And, these type of things. So you, you, you know, you've got to go back and take the whole counsel of God and, and look at what he was trying to impart to us. For me, the Old Testament is the, the, what happens at a national level in the New Testament is what happens at an individual level. And it doesn't it mean we throw out the, the Old Testament. The Old Testament gives us what happens in systems and what happens at a, a larger scale with laws and what are the values that he's trying to teach the Jews that are repl replicational in all nations. And then the, the New Testament is a personalization of it in regards to how do I personalize it and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's, again, the tension of, of the systems at play and then the individual in them um, in that process. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm going to, before we wrap up, I'm going to try to, tweak something that you just said a little while ago and it made me think of the whole sphere of government and I will come back to it but let me press on a little bit further with Acts 19 where Paul goes into Ephesus and yeah. the whole city goes into a rage because his preaching is threatening their business their <laughs> idol making in your teachings about righteousness in the sphere of business have you run into anything like this well you <laughs> <laughs> We can, I, we can make an idol out of anything, you know what I mean? You, you know, so there's no, there's no limit to mankind's foolishness. And, and all they've done is they just commodified and, and, and they've taken this image and then they were business. And business is good at, at marketing and selling. I mean, that's part of what it is. And, and what we tend to do is we pervert it to market and sell our own self or our own idolatry or our own foolishness. Um, and, and again, you can't throw out business just because these guys had taken an idol and, and you know, and they're upset because they weren't really upset that the idol, you know, they're using that as an excuse. So what they were upset about is they were losing their means of income and they were upset because, you know, their loss of power and control and they were feeling vulnerable. And when you get down to it, it's really a sense of when we feel vulnerable, what do we do? And, and these guys were attacking um that process right right uh it makes me think of when jesus went to decapolis and um you know all these swine were you know <laughs> he, he uh he ran them all, well basically they ran themselves but the de yeah. the demons all fled from one guy the demoniac yeah. went into the swine they all ran over the hill and they're all dead and the people are not happy that this poor demoniac got set free yeah. they're upset that they're <laughs> I guess their means of living just ran off with a hill, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were upset because they're vulnerable. And God always makes us vulnerable. He always brings us back to a reference point that we're finite and we need help. And, and where people love to hide, it's, a, it's kind of the modern day um, idol, is we love to hide behind power and money and job protection. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, you know, all of the, a lot of the struggles that are going on out there are, all around jobs and protection and, you know, at a core human level, um, where do I belong and who am I and how can I be safe? 
Mm. Um, you know, so immigrants, immig immigration in, in some of these nations where these guys are coming in and, you know, it, it makes us feel vulnerable. So we want to take it out of the refugees rather than own that vulnerability and bring God into it and ask him how we should live. Right, right. And that really leads to the next scripture uh, from 1 Thess Thessalonians 4.11. And this, is, this can be interpreted in a way that says, go ahead and retreat into your kind of church or religious enclave. It says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. Yeah, I love that purse. <laughs> I, because I, what it does is it, you know, particularly in, in kind of a, a visionary mode, which is great, we need vision. Um, we get all hyped up and we think we have to do more and we have to impact more people and we have to go, 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 do, do, do. And, and for me, I, I love that just because it's Paul saying, you know, a simple life, live a job, do your job well, honor God through the things that he's given to you. Um, live faithfully, be light. In, you know, again, if I go back to like the widow's might, where she puts a couple pennies in the offering and she's given more than all the others. So it's not about how big your impact is. It's not about whether you can grow a business, but whether you can be faithful in that in a way that is truly honoring God and uh, representation of his life in us, irregardless of how much power we have or don't have in the process. So, yeah, mm. I'm yes. not sure that makes sense, but you're, you know, whatever. No, I, I you know, that, there's a very healthy interpretation, but I tend to hear sometimes this kind of scripture interpreted as if the Christian should remove himself as much as possible from all that filthy lucre and mammon. Just oh, yeah. work quietly with your own hands and try to keep out of business as much as you can. Oh. And, yeah, and, well, and, yeah. and that's, yeah, I wouldn't even think that. Yeah, and that stretches over the other spheres of government. Like, well, after all, government's not something we're supposed to be involved in because, I mean, they're, they got military, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. Uh, boy, we, we, we really have kind of lost God's perspective. We really are kind of mindless in a lot of the ways of God. We're shallow. We're narrow-minded. We're, you know, we are in trouble. Um, in so many ways, um, not from God, but but, um, but just we're going to reap the consequences of our shallow, narrow-mindedness, and we are today in a lot of different ways, and we're tempted to blame God, but I, I think what we have to do is stand back and go, you know, we're just not, we, we don't have a deep enough maturity to handle um, how to live in the world that he's called us to, and we, we misinterpret and we look through such narrowness and it really is killing us. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. So again, it's about being a relational being, somebody that's yeah. made in the image of God that um, yes, has the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. Yeah. gentleness, self-control, but in the spheres where yeah, you're doing right. business you're, you, and you are in government. And yeah, that's right. Uh, we are to be salt and light in all these places. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. James four thirteen talks about those who boast about tomorrow. He says, yeah. uh, now listen, you who say today and tomorrow will go this city, that city, you know, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Um, sounds like a rebuke. Yeah, it does. Well, I, again, you, the, what he's trying to get to is where, where do we find our security? And, Business isn't intrinsically evil and it is intrinsically good. It just is. And we can bring evil into it or we can bring good into it as we can all things. Being a father isn't good or it isn't being bad in the, in the automatic mode, in the role mode. It's just what we bring into it. And so, you know, when we start to say, well, I'm, I have enough money to be able to, or I have enough position to be able to say, this is what's going to happen the next days. And I, I can kind of project my will out into the future. Um, that can get us into trouble because what we're relying on is our will. And I think you go back to abiding. What God wants to teach us to is to abide in him and look for his will being done, that, that we would trust him in the moment by moment, the day by day, the week by week to be able to say, okay, you know, 
a cycle, business cycle goes through, there's a slump or a, you know, we hit a, a speed bump or something else goes on, we've got to use that and say, okay, God, how do you want me to walk into this? I don't have anything to be afraid of. Um, and I, I will walk with you through this. So yeah, I, I, again, you, it, it's, for me, it's a little bit hard pressed to be able to, for, you know, uh, again, a lot of times what gets us into trouble when we interpret the Bible isn't what the Bible said. It's the, it's the presuppositions that we bring into our interpretation of it. And that's really where the heart work has to go on um, because your, your, your presupposition to help to define how you interpret a certain verse rather than taking the whole counsel of God and what does his character attributes say about it from Genesis to Revelation. Right, right. yeah. So the, the whole purpose of this podcast is um, basically following through in this motto of youth with a mission, which is to know God and to make him known. We want to make yeah. him known in every sphere. We also need in order yeah. to do that, to really know him after his character. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's, it's a privilege to have you on this podcast uh, discussion today, Matt. Matt, if you, if you were to give us some, some final words, perhaps plug one of your books or something, tell us, Tell us, um, even you, our listeners, how they can get some of your books. But what would you leave behind at this point, too? Oh, what would I leave behind? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not going to plug the books. They are just what they are. So okay. um, I think the, the thing that we've got to do is we, we, the thing really is to go deeper. I mean, we've got to go deep. We've got to kind of to be confronted with ourself and the issues of our own heart. We've got to own our pain and we've got to mature. Um, in order to say anything to the world, we've got to own what's going on inside of us first. We've got to own our fears. We've got to own our pains. We've got to bring God into those so that we can get comfortable within ourselves. So that then when we go into these different places where there's a lot of brokenness, we don't react to it by being controlling or in denial, but we can just speak to it in love and be honest and vulnerable and engaging with those that God has called us to. And I think that's the that's the piece that's closest to my heart is we've got to, the church, the body has got to uh, grow up. The, the, the level of maturity that we have right now is killing us because we're infants, you know, uh, in the ways of God. And we've got to go deeper and in going deeper and in bringing God into a depth in our lives, I think we'll find a, a freshness, maybe a reformation, but a newness of life. And I think that's the thing closest to my heart right now. Amen. Yeah. Well, Matt Rollins, thanks so much for taking the time with us today. I uh, hope we can meet again at some point in the, in the future. Uh, my travels yeah. have been limited of late, but uh, yeah. uh, we'll have to, we'll have to connect again sometime in the future. Grateful for your time with us today. Well, thanks, John, and I, I trust there's a thought in there somewhere that God could use, but it's been a pleasure to hang out with you and anybody who'd care to listen and uh, be with you for this uh, section of time. And, and uh, again, thanks. Amen. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye.